Welcome everybody to the first virtual grand, grand rounds of 2020. Uh, my name is Shannon Strader. I am a fourth year medical student at Lincoln Memorial University in Tennessee. And I am this year's AADMD virtual grand rounds facilitator. For those that are new, virtual grand rounds are a webinar based presentation model that create a space for mentorship an exchange of knowledge experience between seasoned IDD providers and tree level clinicians and future healthcare providers and training. The purpose of the grand round session is to expand and strengthen the IDD healthcare workforce across the spectrum of experience levels. After this meeting, we will be sending out a survey monkey for feedback on, to, on how to improve these meetings. If you have questions throughout the presentation, you may write your questions on the site at any time and we will go over as many as time permits at the end of the presentation. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our wonderful speaker this evening, Dr. Harvey. Uh, Karen Harvey has worked as a clinician in the field of intellectual disabilities for over 30 years. She has a master's degree in clinical psychology and a PhD in applied developmental psychology from the University of Maryland. She has published articles about therapeutic interventions with IDD, workbooks for individuals with IDD, and two books. Her first book, Positive Identity Development, was published in 2009, and in Trauma-Informed Behavioral Interventions, published in 2011. She's currently a consulting with Developmental Disability Departments of Connecticut and Maryland. In addition, she is the director of the program develop, development and training for the Park Avenue group practice. She regularly conducts a variety of trainings for both state level and individual agencies on trauma-informed care and positive identity and development throughout the country. In 2016, she received the Earl Award from NADD for Excellence in Clinical Practice. Thank you so much, Dr. Harvey, for being with us this evening, and I'm so excited to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon, and it was wonderful talking with you before. I, I'm really excited about your series. This is so enlightened and so important, and it's really an honor to present. So thank you so much. I, I really appreciate AADMD and the work that you do and the outreach. So I just want to express my appreciation and express my appreciation to everybody who's on this webinar. Thank you. I know you all have many things to do and thank you so much. So, and the first thing I wanna do is tell you that I have materials. I appreciate NADD because they have posted uh, free materials. So pid.thenadd.org. So when I talk about some of the materials, they're there for free. I have a happiness assessment where we can you know, facilitate the development. It's based on positive psychology and facilitate the development of happiness with folks. I have a goodbye book for um, grief. And I just want to tell you that all those are free. And I, I just want to be able to offer that before I start because I often forget to when I finish. So there we go. And I want to begin today. I, what I want to talk about is trauma in the world of intellectual disabilities. And it is the elephant in the room because it is amazing how much trauma folks have experienced and we don't even realize it. And so today what I'm going, tonight <laughs> where I am on the East Coast, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna talk about the sources of trauma that are specific to folks with intellectual disabilities and that we see a lot of and I, as a psychologist, have seen a lot of throughout the years. And then the effects of that trauma, we'll talk biologically, but we'll also talk about the symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and how they uniquely manifest in the lives of people with intellectual disabilities. And I believe that often we misunderstand the symptoms of PTSD as behaviors. And many of us who have been in the field for years know that we sometimes tend to focus on a behavior, quote unquote, or a behavioral issue, not understanding that that's not someone trying to manipulate their environment. It's actually somebody's trauma response. And it's actually a symptom 
of their post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's what I want to show you today. And finally, I'm going to talk at the end about identity, about healing, about the really important components that people need to heal because people do heal. Post-traumatic recovery is a reality. So once folks have been traumatized, isn't, it isn't like, well, you're condemned for life. Healing happens, but there are certain things that need to be in place for that healing to happen. And I'm going to talk about that this evening as well. So let's begin with the tragedy of abuse of people with intellectual disabilities. So I was very lucky to be part of a brilliant series on uh, done by, I wasn't the brilliant part, <laughs> just let me clarify that. Actually, I was in it accidentally, <laughs> you know, right place at the right time, didn't realize what I was walking into. But this great guy, Joe Shapiro, is amazing. And he did that NPR series looking at the sexual abuse of people with intellectual disabilities. And he went to the Bureau of Justice and said, can you print a report of the incidents of abuse that have been reported, and this is not within provider agencies. These are outside, these are people outside of provider agencies. So already you're leaving out a lot. But he said, you know, can you compare people with disabilities to people without disabilities? And they did, they, they um, did an assessment, they did a report, they looked at their statistics and they concluded that people with intellectual disabilities were seven times more likely to be sexually abused than people without disabilities. And that's horrific, right? So one of my favorite people in the world, Nora Baladarian out of the Spectrum Institute did a great study with, with her folks at the Spectrum Institute in California and uh, they published their results in 2013. They interviewed over 7,000 people and they with disabilities or their family members who spoke for them. And they said, have you been sexually, physically, or financially abused? So they didn't even look at emotional abuse. Have you been sexually, physically, or financially abused? And 70% said they had been abused. 90% said it had been ongoing. And that's, that's horrific, right? Only 37% said they have reported it to authorities or that there was any kind of resolution. So because people felt nothing would be done. I myself have been in situations where things were, were reported, but because folks didn't use words or didn't use enough words or couldn't say, nothing was done. I'd been in too many of those situations. Um, and then we look at emotional abuse, right? There's the bullying is quite a reality, quite a reality in our field. And, you know, my heart breaks because I know we have some moms. I have a dear friend who's a mom who's on this call, she told me. <laughs> she texted me. And, you know, it's, it's hard when we face the fact, nothing hurts us more than our children being hurt. And so the children have that trauma of being bullied so frequently. And then the families have trauma because nothing does hurt more than your child being, you know, hurt in some way. And there's family trauma, there's, there's the, but the emotional trauma of having an intellectual disability, I believe, that you can just assume that there's been trauma. Unless someone has been raised in a bubble, they have encountered bullying. They have been called the R word. You know, children can be cruel, and I'm sorry to say adults can be tr cruel. And these are realities within our field. Recently, the, the trauma field has been talking about something called betrayal trauma. And, you know, I want to address that because I encountered it for years and, and never knew the name for it. So this young lady, um, Tammy, she wanted me to tell her story. And she, here she is. And she said, will you tell what happened to me? And the death, so I was working with her, actually just recently working with her this year because um, she was raped she, and she wants people to know she wanted to step forward and, and have me tell that and have me show her picture and here's what happened she has desperately wanted a boyfriend for most of her life and she was in a day program and she did have a boy that she really a man sorry that she really liked and he liked her but his mother wouldn't allow him to date and his mother was just just shut the whole thing down and she kept talking about how she wanted a boyfriend. And, you know, 
but there was so little opportunity for dating in her life. She finally got some alone time. She has a lot of mental health issues as well, but she got some alone time. And so for two hours every day, she would take walks around the neighborhood. She was really proud of that independent time that she had earned. And this guy started following her. And here's the twist. He started grooming her, giving her rides, and she was really happy because she had a boyfriend. And that's what he told her she was, he was, sorry. And he said, yeah, I'm, we're, we're together, I'm your boyfriend. And then he brutally raped her. And I'm so sorry, I should have said that this content is difficult to listen to. And I understand this is hard to hear. And it, but I, I feel compelled to talk about it because I would say about 80% of the people that I've worked with as a therapist working in this with this group of people, about 80% have had some history of sexual abuse. And that's just what I've encountered. And Tammy wanted me to tell the story because what really devastated her when she came home and she told her staff, she said, I have a boyfriend and I had sex with him, but the sex really hurt and it was hard, but I'll do it because he's my boyfriend. So of course, immediately the staff were alarmed and you know they followed her the next day, they found the guy, he was arrested. And the, the trauma was double trauma. And I've seen this so many times. It was the trauma of, yes, a horrible rape, but it was also the trauma of being betrayed. I thought you were my boyfriend. I thought I finally had a boyfriend. And in my mind, we as the agency were in part responsible because we didn't help facilitate that functional relationship that she had wanted. So many places that I go and places that I've worked, not everywhere, but so many places that I have worked, people weren't even encouraged to date or have relationships, which actually made them more likely to be victimized. And that's what happens. And she wanted me to tell people. And, you know, we're, we're, we did a lot of counseling and she's identified someone. She's excited about dating now. You know, we're, we're learning, we're moving forward. But how do we actually make it worse without realizing it? And I think there's two big things that we do in this field. One is, is that we isolate people and we are not supporting relationships and people do need assistance. They need coaching in developing these relationships. Maybe there's about 10% that know how to advocate for themselves, but many other people really need support with that. And the other thing we do is promote compliance. And I've been in another, a number of situations. Again, I apologize for saying some of this tough stuff, but I've been in, in a number of situations where the staff had abused people. And we have great, wonderful, amazing staff. 99.9% .9 of the direct support professionals that I've worked with are incredible. But every now and then something bad happens. And when we've taught people to be compliant, we haven't helped. So, you know, I, I think we want to look at the, the situations we've set up and how we can move forward and increase prevention. But this is a reality trauma of invalidation and exclusion. Being excluded causes trauma. A study was done out of Duke University with Eisenberger, Dr. Eisenberger, had participants hooked up and to a it was kind of, it seemed very silly. They were playing a game on a computer and they were told there's two other participants in two other rooms and your job is to catch a ball and throw it back and forth with these two people and do it as efficiently as possible, right? But of course, what we psychologists do when we do research is we trick people, we lie to them, and then we see what they do and write about it. So that's <laughs> what happened. So they tricked the participants. There was really just a software program, you know, a little program that threw the ball to the participant for about five minutes. And then for the rest of the 15, 20 minutes remaining, the person did not get the ball. And everybody in the was wired up so they could see where their brain was firing. And when they stopped getting the ball, they would they could see clearly what part of the brain fired. 
and every single participant, and, and this study has been duplicated, every single participant's brain fired in the singular anterior cortex, which is your pain center. So if you broke your foot, your brain would fire there. And that being excluded causes, causes physical pain. And so when I first read this, I thought, well, maybe it was just a bunch of overly sensitive college freshmen who had to do research to pass their Psych 101 class and miss their mothers. You know how that is, right? <laughs> so that's what I was thinking. But then the universe gave me this great gift because for years I taught at uh, graduate school at, uh, at the psychology of trauma at the University of Baltimore. And one year I was teaching this study and I actually had a student in my class who was in the study and he raised his hand. He said, oh my God, I know this, I was in it, I was in this. And let me tell you about him. He was the best looking, most popular kid in the class, lacrosse player, superstar, you know the type. And he'd gone to Duke, you know, superstar. And he's saying, oh my God, it was so frustrating. And I was like, are you sure? It doesn't seem like you're just not getting a ball on a computer. He's like, no, you don't understand. And then I realized, you know, we are wired. We are wired for inclusion because, it, you know, actually David Petoniak talks about that. He said, if biologically we would die out if we weren't wired up to, to need to be together because we just get sick of each other and go back to our caves. Now oh, the heck with the rest of you. So the reality is that exclusion does cause pain and many folks with intellectual disabilities have experienced exclusion on many, many levels. And sometimes inclusion causes exclusion and it's painful. Uh, so I don't know how many of you have been with someone with a disability at the mall or eaten out with them and had someone ignore that person. Maybe you've been at a restaurant and they've asked you what they want to eat instead of asking the person when the person's perfectly capable of showing what they want to eat. So many times I've had these experiences and people aren't stupid. Having an intellectual disability, you know, has nothing to do with intelligence as far as I'm concerned. I believe Howard Gardner is right that there's many, many types of intelligence and I've worked with wonderful, gifted, smart people who just didn't do too well on an IQ test and they know when they're being excluded and exclusion hurts. So there's big T traumas when we know that's happened, right? But then there's also the little T traumas, the little hurts. And you know, I'm not even sure what to put on this list because every time I put little T traumas down, someone will say, you know, that seems like a big T trauma. It's really true. Um, I was able to spend some time in El Paso this summer after the shooting at the Walmart with just wonderful people who dedicated themselves to working with folks with disabilities who were themselves very traumatized. And, you know, they, they just told me, just knowing that that discrimination happened, just seeing it on the news, just going to that Walmart, you know, weekly. The individuals at the day program used to go to that Walmart every week. That was their community outing. And of course, no one wanted to go. One of the individual's uncles was shot and killed. And the discrimination, I would say, when I did, I did a, um, three different trainings just trying to give support to folks. I really appreciate the start people who were able to bring me in. And I must have been so many, I can't tell you how many people came up to me, people who were Latinx came up to me and said, do you know what the shooter said? He went to the police and he said, very proud of himself. I just want you to know I didn't shoot any white people. And so many people told me that that discrimination was so traumatizing and they weren't there. They didn't hear it themselves, but that impact and, and you know, in the political climate where there is discrimination and it, the trauma is significant. And I feel that we have traumatized communities right now. Um, and, and so we have to look at trauma in, on all different levels. And, and look at where it's coming from. It's coming from all different directions. So an interesting study was done. You know, we look at the sources of, of trauma and the fact we don't usually talk about neglect. We talk about abuse, right? We're, we're finally understanding the impact of sexual abuse, the impact of physical abuse, even the impact of emotional abuse, um, the bullying, right? 
but we're just recently starting to really study neglect. A wonderful guy, Nathan Fox, out of the University of Maryland has been looking at it for some years now. And he did the Bucharest Early Intervention Orphan Study, which many of you may know about, where he went to Romania to an orphanage. And he took half the kids there, their kids, you know, zero to five. Most of the attachment theorists would say the damage is already done. They had some kids that were like five or four and a half. And they say, well, they're already, the neglect has happened and it's very damaging. But they took half the kids and they put them in a foster care setting where they were really nurtured, you know, really, really um, supported and nurtured. And then they left the other half in the institution where the institution was very poor. They didn't have a lot of staff. They didn't get a lot of nurturing, you know, and, and they then looked at results. So the kids left in the institution. So this was done over five years. 55% qualified as having some kind of access one disorder. And it was down to 35% of the kids in, in foster care. So thought or mood disorder. And then, of course, the control were kids raised in biological homes, 13%. 49% emotional disorders, down 20%. This foster care setting, all they did was make sure that at least one parent stayed home, unlike most of the states in America we, where we have people work, and that they were understood the, you know, the importance of nurturing. Behavioral disorders, 32% to 25%, that difference is a little smaller because many people dissociate, right, when they're traumatized, meaning they shut down totally. They're not present. So you might not see as many behavioral differences. There's still a difference. And here's the statistic that's most important to me. The average IQ for those children left in the institution was 73 versus 85 for those put in the foster care. So, and these were just randomly selected, these children. So, wow, wow, the impact, the impact is so profound, right? And this isn't, and I'm not saying the IQ means the intelligence, I'm saying an IQ score but I'm talking about fragmented brains where people can't organize themselves to focus on an IQ test. The intelligence is there, but that executive functioning is impaired. The brains of the children left in the institution were actually physically smaller. There were a large number, tragically, of premature deaths. All those children who were neglected, many had high adrenaline levels, which we know is associated with the, with the trauma, looks like ADHD. We, I've seen that a lot, where people don't respond in the medication, or even if they do, they still have that hyper arousal, which is associated with their trauma state. And then, as I said earlier, executive functioning issues. It's profound. So neglect is, is, is really um, impactful. We need that interaction. We have these, we don't know if we actually have mirror neurons or if it's just a brain function, but we do know that that interaction early on in the early days, weeks, and months are so critical for proper brain wiring. And you know, we, we look at many folks that we are working with now, and many of them have come from neglect situations. And what I've encountered basically for about the last 20 years now is a lot of children who were born with cocaine exposure. And, so, and, and uh, there's a certain unique profile. And I talk about this a lot because I don't think we've recognized that the field that we work in, in intellectual disabilities, has actually changed profoundly. Uh, because there's a certain profile. And that profile we see we have folks now, a lot of them, they're about 36, 37 and under. So younger folks who are, are very socially aware, right? They know who's sleeping with who in the day program, which staff are cheating on their spouses. They can give you the up-to-date gossip on everybody, but they can't finish a sentence. And they would rather have a behavioral issue than have anyone know that they can't do something but it's very difficult to learn new tasks because it's very hard to focus. And in the 80s and 90s, there were a number of children who were born addicted to cocaine in urban areas. And a short, a long-term study was done that was really short-term. It was two and a half years. And they 
what they said was because the children were walking and talking at about the same time as in the normal milestones, you know, hitting the normal milestones about the same time as other kids, they said, oh, well, the once they are off, they're born addicted, but once they're weaned off, that they're fine. But that is not true. They did not follow them. Now research shows there's a severe, almost always a severe attention deficit issue and impulse control, you know, a, a clearly like a TBI, you know, traumatic brain injury, there's that impulse control. We're seeing the same pattern now with methamphetamines. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because there's mixed with opioids. In many cases, people born addicted to heroin actually aren't, have not had the same effects through the years, but we don't know now with prescription drugs what that might look like. You know, we don't know. But then let's look at abortion rates. How many people who get, how many mothers who get an amniocentesis that's positive for Down syndrome abort? In 2012, it was 85%. 2014 in America, just in the States, in 2014, it was down to 65%. And I think media has helped. But recently I gave a talk in North Carolina and this wonderful guy was there and he said, you know, we got the positive for Down syndrome and the doctor called us six different times to try to schedule the abortion. And finally, the sixth time, they were so upset, they said, we're going to call a lawyer if you keep pressuring us. And everywhere I go, I hear stories like this. And I've had parents tell me that the doctors have called them, say you have a positive for Down syndrome or you know, spina bifida, or now we, we can screen for so many other things now that we didn't used to be able to. And here's when we scheduled your abortion. So tragically, there's less and less folks with genetic disorders, and, but the substance exposure is, is a reality. And then there's that alcohol drug combination. And, you know, as many of you know about fetal alcohol syndrome, you know, we see not always see, we don't always see those facial features, the smooth philtrum, the always the eyes are kind of half open, the ears lowered. In fact, something I read recently is that actually estimated that only 10% of people with fetal, some, somewhere on the fetal alcohol spectrum of exposure, only 10% have the facial features. But what we do see is that the alcohol damages the ability to connect cause and effect. So you have folks that can talk well, usually can read, write somewhat, but yet aren't sequentially reasoning, aren't connecting cause and effect. So they'll do the same thing over and over, thinking that things are going to be different or get themselves into all kinds of situations because they can't reason through it. So now let's take that inability to connect cause and effect and combine it with the impulse control and difficulty focusing that you see with the drug exposure. These are folks that are coming in the field of adults with intellectual disabilities that have problems and yet have great social awareness, usually have verbal ability, oftentimes have better expressive skills than they do receptive skills. So they can act like they know, but they're not really processing. And our traditional behavioral approaches are not working. Because if they can't reason cause and effect right there, you know you're not going to understand contingencies and rewards and reinforcers. And also these impulses and issues are something that you know can be very easily triggered. And on top of that, many times they've had trauma very early on because they were born into these very erratic situations. And so, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the brain because. I, I want to get to the good stuff. I don't want to get everybody totally depressed and then you go to bed and have bad dreams. I'm very sorry, but I'm going to try and cheer you up. So I got to go fast. But the brain, you know, is it's we're set up to survive. So of course we know our, our limbic system is where we store all of our danger signals and our smart part of our brain, the neocortex is where we process and plan and our reptilian brain, you know, our brain stem just keeps the body going. But I know I have medical students here who are so much smarter than me and can describe it much better, but the reality is that when that limbic system, when that amygdala, which is in the limbic system, gets the message, it's your implicit memory. And when something tells that amygdala that it's in danger, that amygdala remembers, fires with that adrenaline and cortisol and, and gets that brain on high alert. 
activates the fight, flight, or freeze, and the smart brain that plans and thinks logically goes offline because you've got to respond. And so let's say we're driving down the highway and you know there's a Walmart truck. Let's say you're driving down the highway, a Walmart truck runs into your lane and almost creams you and you're like, ah, right? That's not the time that you're gonna say, what is that 1-800 number, let me call. Or you're not gonna say, is that guy texting? No, you're just gonna have to have a full intense response to save your life. And that's when that's why that smart brain has to go offline so you can respond and, and do what you need to do. And your amygdala takes a picture of that truck, right? And let's say three weeks later, you're driving down that highway, you see a Walmart truck, you cut over three lanes because something inside of you says, oh my God, you better get away from that truck. And it's your amygdala, which is your implicit memory. So it's slightly below the conscious level. So you don't even know why you feel that feeling and you put yourself in more danger because you just had a trauma response. And that's what happens to a lot of folks with disabilities, a lot of Walmart trucks. They're like, wow, I've, I've worked with people who somebody walked in the room and all of a sudden they ran out of the program and ran into traffic every time they saw that person. There's no rational connection. The two people that I work with both did that, both putting themselves in harm way, harm's way, both had a history of 41 and 50 another years in an institution where we know somebody abused them who looked like that person. One lady kept running into the street and they called me in to consult and we're trying to figure out what the antecedent was. I said, well, she doesn't want to get out of anything. She went, oh my God, it's when the secretary comes in the room, when the admin person comes in the room. And so we just made sure that she never saw that admin person again. Another was a guy who every time someone had a soda around, and this is crazy. Every time somebody had a fountain soda, he would start screaming and throwing things. And he'd been in the institution for 50 years. We will never know the trauma story in many cases. We will never know what triggered that amygdala. But what we will know is that it's not a rational response. And if we can identify triggers and if we can help people to feel safe, then we can create an environment that they can thrive in. But one, unless we know those triggers, we can't help them to feel safe. We won't always know the trauma story. I've worked with many people who've been in institutions and have all kinds of irrational responses that aren't about them trying to get something they want. They're about trying to stay safe. And that's what your brain tells you. Red alert, red alert. You have to do whatever you have to do to stay safe, right? And that might be fight, flight, or freeze. Uh, Janine, Janina Fisher, who's a brilliant psychologist, said it also brings out your attachment issues. How many people know someone that when they've had a dangerous event, they constantly apologize afterwards? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, even if they had no fault in it. Or they become very needy. I need you, I need you, I need you, right? These attachment issues come up as well. But the fight, flight, or freeze is, of course, what we see. And, and often they are trauma responses that we mislabel as behavioral responses. The amygdala actually becomes enlarged when people have had repeated trauma experiences. And when one part of the brain becomes enlarged, another part shrinks and the hippocampus shrinks. And that's the working memory. So interesting, I, I heard Temple Grandin, a very famous person with autism, she's so lovely and amazing. Um, and she presented and she said, I'm gonna show you a picture of my brain and she put a picture of her brain on the screen. She said, this is the brain of someone with autism. I have an enlarged amygdala and a shrunken hippocampus. And that was an aha moment for me because really it was the brain of a traumatized person. And if you think about autism, it's very difficult to go through life with autism. It's very difficult to be in a world where the sounds are always screaming and confusing and the lights are flashing and you don't know what people mean and there's so many pressures in a world that you don't really understand, but you understand it on a whole nother level that other people don't. And it can be very traumatizing. This is when I usually show a lot of fun videos and people with autism explain it a lot better than I do, but no time for that. I will recommend Emily Titan's interview on YouTube and Carly Fleischman, her story on 2020. And you know, there's a number of people who are really able to articulate this and the experience of how traumatizing it is to have autism better than I can. But it's so important that we understand 
that in itself is traumatizing and and people then they're more prone to behavioral issues because they're actually just being triggered in ways that we don't even understand so they're not manipulating their trauma responses so i want to quickly go through the four areas the four symptom areas of post-traumatic stress disorder in the context of the lives of people with intellectual disabilities so re-experiencing is the first category is according to the dsm-5 so re-experiencing how many of you know somebody with a disability that talks over and over again about something horrible that happened or about someone who died that's because the past is present that's a symptom of ptsd because they're like, my mother died my mother died and then you find out it was 20 years ago right that's an intrusive memory that becomes present when you have PTSD, you, the past is alive. Uh, people need grief therapy. I believe that grief is trauma. And I have the goodbye book on those free materials that we use to process loss. We also use it to help that person feel valued because many people, they've lost the person who valued them and they know everybody else in their life is paid. And sometimes they feel they've lost their own value. So we, we use that goodbye book to kind of process the loss as well as reinforce their value. People have nightmares, people have flashbacks. We see all kinds of things like this. Uh, second uh, category, avoidance. I've seen a number of people who have all kinds of rituals, who have all kinds of things that they do just to stay safe. They often get diagnosed as having an obsessive compulsive disorder, but don't respond to medication. I have so many stories about that, but luckily for you, I'm not going to tell them, <laughs> but I myself do that. <laughs> what things do we avoid? But that's the reality is that um, we try not to be re-traumatized and we end up sometimes irrationally avoiding things. And, and that's, a, that's a whole symptom area. We want to call that, you know, that hypervigilance, right? That hypervigilance of just trying to be so vigilant so you're not traumatized again. And sometimes we place ourselves in more danger when we're trying to get out of danger, like cutting across three lanes to get away from the Walmart truck. Negative alteration in cognition and mood. So this is a lot of words that really are, stand for, uh, you know, that sense of impending doom, right? How many of you know someone like that, where they're just convinced everything is going to hell in a handbasket any minute? Or a person with a disability. Well, you know, no matter what, we're supposed to go visit my mother. You're taking me to visit my mother, but I know the van will break down and then maybe something bad will happen to her and I'll never get to see her and on and on, right? Knowing that things are all going to fall apart, being sure of it, telling everyone that that's a symptom of PTSD. And then finally, arousal, being in that state of hyper arousal all the time. So I work with a number of people who are constantly in that state because they're always being triggered. They think someone is out to get them, someone's going to hurt them, and they're often misdiagnosed as being paranoid. Well, if the people who raised you abused you and you can't trust the ones you're supposed to trust, how do you trust anyone else? When the medication doesn't work and the behavior plans aren't working, look at trauma look at trauma and that that hyper aroused state we often see property destruction we see aggression 99.9 percent .9 of the aggression that i've seen and that i've dealt with has actually been out of fear not because people wanted to hurt someone or do any kind of damage but because they felt threatened and their amygdala was firing saying oh my god the best defense is an offense is off i'm sorry the best offense is a good defense it's getting late for me um, and, and responded with aggression to protect themselves. Because when you've had trauma, what matters the most is staying safe. I like to use this pyramid just to say, I think for years we've looked at the behavior, it's only the tip of the iceberg. And sometimes we re-traumatize people when we shame them about their symptoms of PTSD. Look at you, look at what you did. You know what your behavior plan says, you know what you're supposed to do or trying to appeal to their rational. I wrote myself some very bad behavior plans that said, don't throw that chair, you'll lose your soda. 
tell staff and the test I, I would tell the dsp to say that oh don't throw the chair so the person would throw the chair and then they would punch the staff for saying they would lose their soda right <laughs> and i i missed the boat entirely because you can't appeal to that neocortex or that smart brain when somebody's in trauma mode and so by telling them that they're going to lose points or lose a soda or you don't want to do that and they want they would just freak out even more because underneath is emotion and underneath that is trauma and the best staff, the best DSPs that I've ever worked with are ones who know how to get to the emotion, who know how to listen, who know how to give support. And these are soft skills that we don't teach the front line. We don't teach aides in school. We don't teach DSPs active listening, how to support trauma informed supports. And this is what we, I think we really need to start teaching these soft skills because when people can release that emotion in a safe place, when they can feel that I'm going to be okay, we're not going to see those symptoms of PTSD. We're not going to see people triggered. Being able to communicate emotional safety is the most important quality in a frontline professional. And that emotional safety is communicated through listening, through respecting, through valuing, through caring. And we all know what it's like to be with someone that doesn't like you. Maybe not you guys, because I'm sure you're very likable. I know you are. But you know, when you're around someone that you know doesn't like you, you don't feel safe, you don't feel comfortable, right? And you start to kind of go within yourself or maybe try and find ways to get out of the situation, do whatever you have to do. So when a person is, is at the mercy be it a staff person, an aide or whoever, of someone that they know doesn't like them or that they feel isn't caring about them, that can be very traumatized and that traumatizing and it can be unsafe. It can be unsafe. And the best staff, the staff that anyone will calm down with, what I call magic staff that you can give anybody to and that person will just chill out, right? They'll just be so happy and so, so chill. Those people listen they respect, and they communicate safety. I, I'm someone you're cool with. I like you. I care about you. That's so powerful. Let's look at a trauma response versus a behavior response. That trauma response is irrational. It doesn't serve the person well, but I believe about 90% of the behavioral issues that I've dealt with have been trauma responses. I used to think 10% were trauma responses and 90% were behavioral responses. But as I see more and more people through the years of doing therapy, through the years of getting to know folks, I see so many people just reacting because they don't feel safe, reacting because they're trying to protect themselves, attacking because they feel attacked, not because they want to get something. And when we do that functional assessment, we assume that people are acting with intent and they're not always acting with intent. In fact, it almost sets up an adversarial relationship because we tell them the frontline person implementing this plan, look at what that person is getting out of this behavior when oftentimes they're not getting anything. They're making their life worse, but they're freaking out. And that's what's the behavior. The behavior is a symptom of their trauma. So how can we help people to heal? The most important thing, there's three factors. And, and the most important thing is really what's going on programmatically. Therapy is great, but therapy doesn't work if you're going home to an unsafe situation or you're working with people you're not safe with or you're at the mercy in some way of people that have power over you who you don't feel have your best interests, right? This is a reality. So how people recover is when they perceive themselves as safe. And when you finally feel safe, that's when you can recover. And safety is about safe relationships. Because I know all the places I've worked, we've done a lot of drills. We had the fire drills, the earthquake drills, you name it, we had a drill. But that didn't communicate safety to the people living there. What communicated safety was that their staff really cared, the staff listened, the staff was there for them. The DSP was someone who got them, who really got them. And sometimes I would see people who were just fine, all of a sudden you have a new staff or you have somebody or you have a manager or whoever who makes them feel unsafe and they're off the hook. And that's the key. That's why we have to teach that soft skill of communicating emotional safety. Next is connection. I so strongly believe that people 
are too isolated the, and who have intellectual disabilities. We have to overcome this. We have to facilitate relationships. We can teach the DSP to coach relationships, to coach having bonds, to coach significant others, to coach dating, and not just coaching, but facilitating, teaching those skills and then helping it happen. That is so important. And, and I think, you know, the more we can help people to be connected, the less isolated they'll be. And then when they're isolated, they're re-experiencing their trauma so that when they're not isolated and when they're in relationships, they're going to be able to move their life forward. And finally, power and control. Bessel van der Kolk talks about the need for agency, the need for a sense of being able to move your own life forward, to be able to act on your life with choice, with will, with power, at least have a choice that's real and not fake. We have a lot of really nice plans and the state thinks they're beautiful, but sometimes they're not implemented. So do people have real choices? Do they have power over their lives? Even the small things I think are so important because when you feel like you have something to get up in the morning for and a way to make a difference and a way to make a choice that's real, you can live in the present. When you feel hopeless, helpless, that other people are in control, you're gonna re-experience that past over and over again. You're gonna be stuck in that loop of trauma. There was a study done that was so important with the DSPs. Um, Sin, S-I-N-G-H, I'm probably saying his name wrong, he's a brilliant, brilliant researcher. And he taught mindfulness to staff, just 12 weeks where there were a lot of restraints going on. They had three to four restraints every week. And he just did a 12 week session on mindfulness with the direct support professionals and incidents and the actual restraints went to zero because people would stop, check in with themselves. They learned to be mindful. They learned to breathe. They learned to think. They learned to process before they just jumped into a power struggle. And I think the real key in, in being programmatically trauma-informed is to be able to reduce power struggles because power struggles are what make people feel unsafe. That power differential, right? And that, that power struggle is what triggers the incident so often, right? How can we train that frontline to be supporters? How can we all be supporters? You know, how can we look at our role differently? rather than telling someone what they have to do, trying to control their behavior, trying to direct them all the time. How can we support them so they can thrive and they can evolve? That's so critical. A study was done in Iraq, the PTSD study, where they looked at people who both had the same trauma, and but some developed severe PTSD to the point when, when they returned home, they couldn't keep a job, they, their marriages fell apart, maybe they developed an addiction, and others didn't. And they looked at all the factors, you know, money, position, education, relationships, and they found two things that, that correlated with people who did not develop PTSD. One was the ones that were Skyping and connecting with friends and family all throughout their time there, lots of family, lots of friends, lots of support, they did not develop PTSD. And two, the ones who felt like they were very close to their people in their unit. Both factors were about relationships. Sadly, folks with disabilities are often very isolated. They often don't have a lot of friends and friendship heals. Friendship is so important. How can we facilitate relationships, friendships, lots of social activity, or depending on that person, maybe they don't want a lot of social activity. Maybe they want to just sit and watch a movie with a buddy, whatever it is, or go on a date, have lots of dates, whatever it is, relationships heal. How can we facilitate them more? How can we redirect what we're doing, stop worrying about people's behavior and start worrying about their the quality of their life, the supports they need, relationships. Therapy helps. I never want to leave that out. I do EMDR and it's, the, here's a woman, um, and EMDR is very successful with folks with disabilities. So I'm going to play this briefly, just have one minute, because um, she would like me to share this. We have a trauma program. We had one at the Ark of Baltimore and we took every year from September to June, 10 people where we knew they had a trauma history. 
And what's interesting is we thought we knew what their trauma was. Many of them had healed from the initial trauma that we knew about and the relationships were what helped them heal. So this woman, Elena, she had a significant other in a group home that no one knew that that was a, a love relationship, her and a woman named Mary. And then this is a hard thing that happened. It was sad. One day they were eating dinner and Mary didn't want to eat her dinner. And Elena told her, you better eat, you better eat. And Mary stuffed the food in her mouth really quickly, said, see, I'm eating, and then stuff, 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 and choked and died. How horrible. So Elena blamed herself for her death. And we got her 20 years later, and she was full of anger at herself. She wouldn't sing. She wouldn't smile. She wouldn't talk. We, had, we did music therapy. That's why I say sing. We did group therapy in this trauma program. We had a drum circle. We did EMDR. We did all kinds of work. And then she opened up to the group. The group was who helped her. Group therapy with folks with ID has been just the best thing in my life. I, I love it so much. And the group helped her more than we did because the group told her it's not your fault. And she really heard it for the first time. And we made these memory boxes honoring the people they lost. And here she is. And I made this for my roommate, Mary. I missed her and I love her. Good job, Mary. And I also put a message to you. Okay. Dear roommate, I miss you and I love you. Good job, Thank you. She wouldn't work. She wouldn't do anything. She wouldn't participate. She now is working. She is blossoming because she needed that grief counseling. And people need that. People also need a sense of self to heal. Daisaku Ikeda says, ultimately happiness rests on how you establish a solid sense or, of self or being. This is critical to healing from trauma, a sense of identity. Here he is with Nelson Mandela, who had a very strong sense of identity, regardless of 27 years in prison. He came out, he not only changed South Africa, he changed the world because he knew who he was. He had a sense of identity and a sense of purpose. And I think that's really important. So I believe really strongly that what we can do to foster healing is help people have a sense of identity, a sense of self. They should have identity in their community. And it's okay to have a community of people with disabilities, whoever you identify with. I identify as a Buddhist. I chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. That's my community. I have community of friends in the disability world who I love. I have so many communities and they have helped me so much. You can have multiple communities, but you have to have a community. Many people are not going to the church they grew up in because they're going to their staff's church or no church. You need a spiritual community. This is a part of identity. Family is a part of identity. Family is so important, yet many people have no family. Many people who were dropped off in the institution on the doctor's recommendation at two or three grew up for 50 years in an institution without family. The rest of us, when we don't have family, we make our friends our family, we marry, or even when we do have family, we create our own. People with disabilities should have the right to marry, to create their own families, to have friends. Friends are part of identity as well. And finally, that focus on the self, to have an awareness of who you are and awareness of how you feel. Many people I know can tell, can go on and on about what their behavior was. When I ask them, how are you? They'll tell me, oh, I've been good today. But I say, wait, 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 how are you feeling? And then they're stumped, right? Because they're telling you about how they look to you, not how they feel, because they're not centered internally. That internal locus of control is so critical. How can we foster that? Fostering a sense of identity is critical to healing. A sense of purpose or mission, I make a difference. This is who I am. This is all about identity, all about the self. And then when you know who you are, you can move forward in that world and you can heal. So that is the end of my talk. I actually left five minutes for question. I can't believe it. I never do that. I'm trying to get better. So and <laughs> thank you so much. That was really, really, really great. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, we have some questions. So the first one is, what is EMDR. Oh, thank you. I should have explained that. So it stands for Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing. And it was developed by Francine Shapiro. 
and initially used for bets because it, it involves bilateral stimulation, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And people who are stuck on a trauma get unstuck. And it is very effective with people with disabilities. I've used it with people who are non-speaking. So, you know, it can be used on all different levels and it really gets people kind of unstuck from whatever their loop they're in. Uh, Francine Shapiro tragically uh, died uh, this year, last this last year of breast cancer, but uh, she's written many books, EMDR, and there's also therapists all over the country now trained in it. Um, and I think just recently people are starting to use it with displays. I've been doing it for 20 years and it's my, just always my go-to approach. Thank you. Um, this was at 8 p.m. when we were talking about institutions. Uh, uh, one of the institutions in Glenwood, Iowa is uh, presently being investigated for experimentation on persons residing there. They were doing sexual arousal experience, experiments and abuse. The director has been fired. You have to be really careful in institutions. Um, that was, I guess. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, that sounds awful. It's horrible. Uh, was this recent? Yeah. Oh no. It says it was recent. I'm so sorry to hear that. And you know, those people need treatment right away. Oh my gosh. And that's the problem. Oftentimes we don't go to therapy. That's not the go-to. Right? We're looking at behaviors. We're looking at all kinds of things, but we don't figure out how to do therapy with folks. And it's really important to do. And people really, really benefit from therapy. And when they've been traumatized, they need therapy. Um, yeah, for sure. I, I was asking uh, actually a child abuse lawyer and I didn't really realize this, but there are like certain, um, I guess, uh, like educational like brochures on how to really nail uh, like abuse that's not like bruises or like traumatic brain injury, mm -hmm. something that's so obvious. And do you have any suggestions for like medical students or dental students like like the small sense, like you just feel something's not right, but there's not yeah. really tangible yeah. evidence. Well, I love the way you put that, that you feel something's not right. And actually what I often talk about is trusting your gut. If you feel something's not right, something's not right. And you wanna go with that and you wanna investigate and you wanna talk and you wanna ask questions. I, the, my biggest regrets are times when I knew something wasn't right, I asked questions and then I let it alone and later found out there was abuse going on. There are two incidents like that, that you know, I kicked myself because I said, oh, they're all said, oh no, that's our best staff. Oh no, that's a great person. And then found out later there was abuse. Trust your instinct, sure. trust your instincts. Okay. And also look for changes. So if there's a change, there's a change in behavior, all of a sudden someone is really having a hard time or really being aggressive or breaking things, there's always a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so look for those kind of significant changes. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, another question, thank you so much. This is superb. Biggest challenge I see is that many professionals and others do not believe that individuals with IDD do not have or do have feelings and it portrays itself. How do you think that we can get uh, colleges and grad schools to build this into their curriculum? Oh, that's the best question. I, I don't know. I, I'm ranting and raving, jumping up and down. Um, I guess I have to challenge all of you, like let's all unite and really try to get the message across that these are people, they're human beings and they're not less complex, they're more complex. And the mm -hmm. trauma is more impactful on them, not less, because they're already marginalized. And we've got to get people to see that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, in my experience, I tried to get curriculum changes this past year. Um, I was able to do a disability day, but uh, I think the problem with med school and specific, specifically is that it doesn't make it right, but as the board exams, there's not, 
it's not it doesn't show up on board exams any idd um mm -hmm. questions there they don't exist and unfortunately med school seems to be more of of like let's get you through boards and get you into a good residency because that's all they care about right now which is not right but that's <laughs> what it seems to be like and since it's not on the board then people don't really care that it's not in curriculum and i think what i foresee happening to make a real big change is to start making it on boards and try to make developmental because I didn't have any questions on my board, all three board exams on autism, CP, none of it was on there, not even in the, in the um, other options for questions, not even being the right answer. So I think that would be like a really good way to attack it. <laughs> I agree. Um, I, I think because you've got a mission, Shannon. I'm not kidding, really. You, I am so grateful to hear that you're doing this and you're young and you're, I think a lot of it is going to be up to the younger folks in our field because a lot of us who are older, we kind of have old school views. And when I train and oftentimes it is the younger people that really get it. I mean, not, there's older people that get it too, don't get me wrong. But I, I feel like you guys are going to be the best voice. Thank you. I'm yeah. learning so much from you. Um, <laughs> okay, so another one. It seems that some people with IDD experience trauma from experiences that the neurotypical uh, population do not see as traumatic. How can that be verbalized or talked about? Oh, yeah. yeah. And you see that a lot with autism. Yeah, it's I think we have to talk about and we have to listen, you know, to those who can express it to get them to to talk to explain things to us. That's why I, I recommended those videos, the YouTube videos and wherever somebody is explaining what it's like for them. I think we all have to listen and really get that they're telling us the truth and it's tough. Thank you. That's great. I guess we probably should wrap up since we're after nine. Yeah, uh, so for the people, there are several questions about PowerPoint and resources again. Um, I'm happy to share. So, okay, I can send that all out to all the people who registered. Um, if you just want to send that to me or, sure, just please, yeah, or I can give you. I, did, I think you do have them, right? I'll, I'll send it again to make sure. And, oh, oh, yeah, I do have them. Never yeah. mind. I'll and send it out to everyone just, asking. You know, if you use them, just credit me. <laughs> Thank you so yes. much. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I need that okay. to the larger well, group. But I really want every, I give all my stuff to everybody free because I just want to get the word out. And you so don't much. have to credit me. It's okay. You can steal it. I don't care. It's been done many times. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no. I would never do that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. I'm old. What do I care? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Harvey. And thank you for all those who attended. We had a great turnout tonight. So um, everyone have a great night and uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.